I'm Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, I met up with Ava Liss, a co-founder and CEO of Colliver Biosciences, and Yushan Lin, an associate professor of chemistry at Tufts University. They discuss the reality, the capability, and the potential of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The first thing I'm going to do is just thank you both for joining me um, for the, the Exploration Science Podcast. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Oh, you bet. Awesome. Yeah, it's so, always great to chat with you, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So maybe, um, you know, the way I like to start is to really give people a background of, of who you are. So, um, Ava, you happen to be on my screen as the speaker right now. So maybe you can <laughs> give a little background of, you know, where what you did for undergrad and how you got to where you are now. Sounds good. So, um I always like to say that I, my hands have touched many different parts of science, which is uh, what excites me, because I started my undergrad as a chemist, actually. So my first world of science was running flash columns, TLC plates, um, but we were actually trying to understand enzyme mechanisms. So I was already you know, starting to get involved a little bit with like protein expression and purification. And um, so after um, my chemistry degree, which was actually at Cornell, I ended up uh, hating uh, the East Coast so much (laughs) because of the weather (laughs) that I applied pretty much to only uh, schools on the West Coast for my PhD. And I ended up going to Scripps, uh, which is here in La Jolla, and I've stayed in San Diego ever since. Um, Spent a lot of time during my PhD engineering microorganisms, including yeast. And the idea was to figure out if we can actually inhibit mutation Um, And so we found the genes that are involved in mutation processes. And then we actually found small molecules um, that inhibit mutation in yeast. So that was actually really fun. So a lot of genetic engineering. Um, And then I was supposed to do a postdoc, but we ended up actually starting a company (laughs) that we run uh, inside a lab at UCSD. So this was like a sponsored research project. And we were back then, that was, um, that was 2008, and we were trying to engineer algae to make biofuels. Um, of course, you know how the story ends. Uh, biofuels from algae are not economically feasible. Yeah. And so it was really fun. I absolutely enjoyed working in a small dynamic team, but we had to kind of uh, move on, right? Because it was hard to raise fun- funding. So we actually um, ended up taking some of that technology to Life Technologies, which is now Fisher Sciences, and we commercialized the tools that we developed for other people to do research with algae. Um, so that was really exciting. And Life Technologies is the first place where I actually got introduced into computational approaches, believe it or not. Um, so they were very interested in making sure the products are super robust. And so they taught everybody Six Sigma, statistical design of experiments, modeling approaches, Um, And I absolutely fell in love with that. And pretty much ever since then, which was like 2011 timeframe, I was really hungry to learn more about it. Um, So even though I held another job before I started Colbert at Genomatica, where we also engineered microbes, um, I started spending a lot of time just self-learning, honestly. Um, You know, I always tell people that, well, how do you do it? How do you get an additional degree, right? A lot of people get MBAs while they're working for companies. Um, I pretty much got what would be an equivalent, more or less, of a degree in computer science um, because I was so hungry to learn more about it that I would get up in the morning at 5 a.m. Before I showed up at work at 9, I spent four hours taking online classes um, and really coming up to speed in this area of data science, um, computer science, and machine learning. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, And so in 2014, I started Colibur, which is the company that I've been with ever since. And we essentially help other companies to utilize AI and machine learning on their data sets. Sorry, that was a little bit long. (laughs) No, that's (laughs) That's fantastic. Isn't it? That's incredible. You know, I remember actually, I almost was trying to get money to invest into algae, into biofuels. And then um, luckily I didn't have money at the time, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> the second thing was that I was sort of, yeah, sort of like learning more about the, the cost of production and all of that. But, uh, but I do remember being very excited at the time and being like, I got to get money to invest there. <laughs> so, no, but it's a fantastic story. And, and I think that it, I love the whole, the self-learning that, yeah, you don't have to have formal coursework to go become an expert in an area. So, yeah. 
Yushen, tell me about you. How did you get to Puffs? Oh, gee, it's going to be a long story. Uh, so I am originally from Taiwan. So how I got into chemistry is I went to an old girls high school. And in Taiwan, you have to apply to a specific department when you apply for undergraduate degree. And then so you need to know what you're going to major in, right? So I have three very good friends at that time, and they are very interested in math, physics, and biology. Oh. So my teenager might look at this and then say, how can I be relevant? but not competitive. I was like, chemistry. So I went to my chemistry teacher and said, hey, I want to, you know, major in chemistry in college. And then she was so shocked because chemistry was not my strongest subject. And then, but she was very supportive. And then I studied and I got into um, National Taiwan University. And I am not kidding. I think in the first parents um, professor meeting, my parents apologized to my major <laughs> advisor and then said, oh, she's going to be so bad please take a care of her. <laughs> and then uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was an experimentalist. So I worked in a laser lab in uh, Peter Joe's lab, and I was synthesizing uh, gold nanoparticles. And then uh, since it's a laser spectroscopy lab and everything has to be super dark, and I started naming old equipment after my ex-boyfriends because they never cooperate, never cooperate. I was like, oh, Michael, this is what you did today, huh? And then I was like, this is, this is not good, right? And then I was taking all sorts of classes, and then I realized that, oh, I, I really like the theory part. I like to have a framework that I can explain different things. So when I was applying to graduate school, I asked Peter to, you know, uh, recommend some schools in the U.S. for me to apply to. And then I uh, went to UW-Madison for my graduate study. And then over there, I worked with uh, Jim Skinner on theoretical vibrational spectroscopy of water and peptides. So I did not dream that one day my work will have relevance to, you know, like, Biotech, uh, biotech at all. Mm. Um, but then I moved on to uh, Stanford to work with DJ Pande on, uh, on protein voting. So we, uh, I use uh, distributed computing voting at home to study amyloid beta peptides. And uh, after that, I started at Tufts in 2012. And so I uh, want to, you know, use what I have learned before for my independent research. And I know I have to differentiate myself from BJ, right? So they are trying to be able to simulate larger and bigger proteins. So I uh, was very interested in post-transition modifications and also uh, cyclic or stable peptides. Mm -hmm. So then we are not trying to go big, but we are trying to say, hey, there are all these different things or you know, cyclic, funky peptides. Uh, they have a lot of uh, important, uh, I guess, health relevance and medicinal relevance as well. So uh, they are also challenging to study using computational chemistry, it turns out. And then, so that's how I uh, get into, got into the area. And uh, um, with regarding to machine learning, so it's not exactly in my training Either, either just as Eva, so then I had to uh, pick it up myself, and then uh, we read papers, right? And I was also, you know, just taking like a Coursera course on machine learning, and then doing all the problem sets, and then that's when you realize that you, you think only students procrastinate. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Professors also procrastinate, and then I think it's a very valuable experience for me because it puts me back into being a student. And then, uh, you know, I will be like 3 a.m. trying to submit a problem set that's due like at night, right? So it makes me uh, more uh, sympathetic and empathetic about uh, students' life as well. Definitely. Hey, there's power in procrastination. We all know this from the uh, like PhD comic series and, and Google, right? Procrastination yes, yes. can come. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, I think you can be a productive procrastinator so because if you have one thing on the list of 10 that you just don't want to do the most, you do the other nine things. But by the time you finish the other nine things, something even worse came up. And then you're like, okay, fine, I'll do that one thing that I hated. And so it, you're, it, you, you actually turn out to be pretty productive. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. How about you, Ava? Are you much of a procrastinator or are you just like oh. always? No. <laughs> well, okay, so... I am, uh, this drives my husband crazy, is I, I plan everything <laughs> um, to the point where sometimes, you know, I want to have my ski vacation planned at least a, a week ahead of time. And he's more like the night before he's like, oh, let's go skiing tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But that, 
allows me because I work on so many different aspects. Um, you know, when you're when you're a co-founder of a company, you have to wear different hats, literally minute mm -hmm. to minute sometimes. And if yep. you don't have control over what's happening, it can be extremely stressful. So I had to learn how to plan and how to be able to juggle a lot of things. Um, but I do occasionally find myself in this um, position of like, uh, I would just put something up that maybe there will be another solution I will think about in the future or, or um, so my mind still keeps on working on the problem, but I don't necessarily actually make progress. Right. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do. I do also like to plan, but then somehow there are things that in your mind, you have an innate clock that, you know, I can get this done in however many hours. Right. And then you, you yeah. don't work until that time starts to, Tick in, but then that's like very unhealthy. I think I I I would I would much rather you know get it done sooner, right? And then don't uh, have this kind of stressful situation yeah. because if you wait until the last minute, any little thing that happens can just you know throw off your plan. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm I'm a planner and a procrastinator. I mean, I think we <laughs> all are, right? Like to some degree, but I do. I love making my my deadlines. Right? If I have a deadline, I'll make it. But I yeah. will probably procrastinate up until. You know, pretty close to the deadline. And it depends on the project, right? Like, exactly, there's a, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Ava, actually, and I, I promise we're going to get deeper into the science, but some of this stuff is just so cool and fascinating, right? So, so you founded Colliver, but I, did, I guess I didn't realize that that first company that you worked for was one that you were also a founder of. So, did oh, I, I wasn't. I was the oh. first employee. And first I employee, have, okay. I still have like some kind of plaque that says first employee of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But so, I, you know, I interacted with the founders to write the business plan, raise sure. the money. So okay, um, okay. Yeah. So you didn't get the title of founder, but you did some no. of the footwork. Exactly. So did that make it a little easier, or I guess like maybe less scary to start Caliber? Or tell me about that. That's the thing is I think a lot of things seem scary, right, and kind of almost magical until you actually start working in it, right? For a lot of people, machine learning and AI seems magical, right? Yeah. But until you actually get into it and see how the sausage is made, you're like, okay, this makes perfect sense. It's the same with starting companies, right? It's like the, the best thing to do, honestly, is to go talk to people that have done it, right? And they will literally take you through the steps. The first will be like, okay, so you need a lawyer to file incorporation papers. Then you need to open a bank account. Then you need to raise money, right? And at the end of the day, it's really no different than running an academic lab. Um, but you see a little bit more of the administrative aspects of what happens, right? Because you have to be involved in some of it. Um, but I, I honestly think... Um, it's just one of those things where you just have to talk to people that have done it before and then they demystify the entire process. Sure. It's really not that complicated. Sure. And doing, I think doing too is the, the best way to get over something, anything, right? Anything. That exactly. you're yeah. So you, Shan, um, Ava used the word magical. In the projects that you're working on right now, what do you think an onlooker looking into your research would be like, that's a magic project. Like what's the most sort of fascinating magical project you have right now? Well, uh, I guess at this moment, I am probably most excited about uh, our work of using machine learning to replace the need to run molecular dynamic simulations. Oh. So um, I think molecular dynamic simulation, you know, is, uh, is a great technique. Right. So then you can watch how your peptides move and then you can, you know, characterize the structural ensembles. So you don't care if it's low structure or not. So even if it's like a funky secret peptide that has multiple confirmation, I can report those and I can tell you what's a percentage of each confirmation, which will be very helpful for, you know, structure based design. Right. And then um, the the sad thing is it's so slow to run. Right. So then it takes one day, two days to finish the simulation for one secret peptide, then on um, my nodes at Tufts, we can probably do, you know, 50 per week, right? Nobody is going to use some technique that does 50 sequences per week as a screening tool, mm -hmm. right? So then you can use it to explain, for example, some very specific system, why this secret peptide works, that secret peptide doesn't work, but then you cannot use it as a, as a discovery tool, as a screening tool. So to make molecular dynamic simulation, an applicable technique for drug development, especially for screening, 
uh, you need to get it to run faster. Mm -hmm. So then you can think of, oh, I can be more powerful computer. I can buy more computer. I can improve the enhanced sampling methods. So what we are doing here is we decide to buy the bullet once. So we will run simulations. We'll spend time and resources to run simulations for, for example, hundreds of sequences. But then we want to then take the results and say, hey, can I build a machine learning model? They will recapitulate those. Because if I can, then when I give you a new sequence, you no longer need to spend two days running your simulation. You just ask the machine, what do you think? And they will give you results that are very close to if you actually spend the two days to run simulation. Yeah. So this is one way to enable us to get MD molecular dynamics quality results, but then with less than one second. And then that puts this method onto the map that people can consider using uh, for drug development for sickly peptides. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, and I, I, I just want to add to that. So it's very important for people to really kind of realize that machine learning requires an investment, right? Yes, so it requires yes. your an data, investment. yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Your training data, very important. The data, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of the best projects that we've ever done in the past were projects that we could leverage public data sets that were available. Mm -hmm. But even if the you know somebody had already large available data sets, you can move so much quicker, right? You can't get something out of nothing, right? So really investing in developing good data sets um, is absolutely critical mm -hmm. to a lot of these methods really working well. It's it's not a technique that you can apply into like thin air, right? So I think uh, there's a little bit of misconception there in terms of what machine learning is capable of. Sure. So are any um, large companies coming together to help sort of pool their data sets to really improve knowledge in that area? So early on in, um, let's say a couple of years ago, there were some companies um, that actually tried to potentially make pools of data available for, for uh, small molecule drug discovery specifically. Um, I don't know what, uh, what came to fruition, right? Because of course there's IP issues, right? Because all of these are proprietary compounds. But when you do, um, I, th I think we're, what needs to happen is more government investment in actually releasing some of data sets that um, academic researchers have been working on into the public domain, but in such a way, because it's taxpayers' dollars, right, that paid for it, but in such a way that data is accessible to other people, right? Um, and so I think that's what's really, really critical, um, is for there to be a focus on not just publishing, but actually making the data available for reuse uh, by other people, by, by other researchers, right? Some of the best innovations that have happened during COVID uh, were innovations where machine learning was applied to drug repurposing, right? Where you could take existing data on how, um, for example, compound libraries um, were affecting cell lines, right? Um, and which receptors were being activated or deactivated. And then one could say, well, this is a receptor that's important for COVID, right? And so somebody could repurpose very quickly um, the drugs for COVID and start testing them in animals uh, right away rather than doing a lot of in vitro tests. But that's because those data sets were actually available for, for people to be able to do that very quickly. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know when I was working at, at Farin, we had some projects and we would run um, talk screens through like Discover um, X um, or Eurofins, whatever they've changed their name, I think a couple of times. But anyway, but they, we, we would use the... Um, the targets that were from a publication where some of the major companies came together and said, don't hit these things, but you want to make sure your molecules don't go after that. So, yeah, I mean, obviously large corporations can work together while maintaining IP, but to make sure, I mean, so there must be certain even attributes, right? That, but, I, but I agree with you with the, the government um, really implementing within their grant system that the data sets have to become available. Yeah, no. not not as an afterthought, but really kind of giving funding yes. for um, for consortiums to actually collect these data sets together, right? Because you can't put the burden on somebody who uh, who's trying to uh, you know develop their career. They're trying to publish as much as possible, get tenure. You can't put burden on those people to actually make databases. Right. This needs to be something that a group of people actually is qualified um, and and expert in doing, and they actually collect those data sets and make them available to other people. I think that's the way it should be done. So that's that's the way I kind of see it um, as helping others. That makes sense. So um, can you talk a little bit about Colibur and sort of the, the areas that you've got um, projects in? Because I know it's kind of a, a wide range of, of services that you provide. 
Yeah, so um, I'll maybe mention some of the projects that we've done in the past that were like really exciting. Um, so when we first started, we actually spent quite a bit of time working on images, um, so histopathology images, and we developed systems for analyzing um, images of cervical cancer cells to be able to identify within that image uh, which cells um, are cancerous and what grade they have. So this is very important, obviously, for cancer screening. Um, what was exciting about the project is we actually exceeded the performance that a pathologist um, would normally have uh, because a computer doesn't get tired, right? So it can just spend as much time as it wants looking at the cells. So that was a really great project. Um, and uh, what, uh, so last year we also worked um, in helping a company uh, build models to predict which patients would respond to a drug. Uh, based on transcriptome data sets from tissue biopsies, right? So there was, again, really exciting, extremely challenging data sets because we have, you have very few patients, right? Sometimes you only have 30 patients, but when you look at gene expression, you have 40,000 genes that you're looking at, right? So you have to work really hard to dimension reduce those data sets to pull out those um, genes that actually matter. Um, so super exciting work. Um, and then, of course, um, as you know, I've spent a lot of time, several years now, working on developing an AI platform for peptides. Um, so this is a platform that um, has been funded by National Science Foundation, so I'm really grateful that we can access um, that type of funding. And with that platform right now, we're applying it to many different data sets. So these are data sets that typically come from drug discovery projects. Um, anything from high throughput screens using phage display or peptide arrays, right, where we try to identify the true positives, um, all the way to, um, you know, in vitro um, lead optimization, right, where somebody makes several modifications to their peptides, uh, and we try to help predict new variants that haven't been tested yet that are likely to have better properties. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're working on. Uh, we have some really exciting work um, that we're also doing in trying to um, make sure that we can visualize and analyze design space, peptide design space, right? Because there's so many possibilities when you make peptides, but how do you actually explore that space efficiently? So uh, what's interesting is I'm applying some of the methods and concepts that I you know, learned at LifeTech in 2011 in terms of design of experiments to actually develop methods for design of experiments within the peptide space. Um, so it's super exciting and it's a really great area to work in. Yeah. And I saw on your, you know, going through the website that if someone has an idea, but maybe they don't quite have the funds available to, to just pay for the service that you can do like sort of small projects or even like a collaboration. Yeah. So we have actually collaborations that we've done with academic labs. Um, so we typically co-publish. Uh -huh. So last year we actually had a collaboration with Scripps Research where we helped um, make machine learning models of um, to help uh, with peptide docking, right? So when you dock peptides, um, there's, you know, hundreds of um, thousands of poses that you are going to get, right, from your docking program, but then you have to score those poses to figure out which ones are correct. Mm -hmm. And so we actually utilize machine learning to build better scoring functions, um, and that was published last year. So we do, we have another collaboration that we cannot announce yet um, on phage display, but um, again, we're going to um, hopefully co-publish. Um, and this helps us, you know, continue developing the technology, but it also helps the academic researchers with, you um, uh, you know, getting um, more uh, kind of interesting results, right? And a kind of different perspective, I think, on designing the compounds rather than just uh, what they're used to. Sure. And so, Yushan, um, you know, I also was looking through like your publications and, and you have a lot of collaborations, including, by the way, with one of my former colleagues, Antoine Henneau. So he and I actually worked together at Faring. Um, and he's oh, now- Oh, cool. Yeah. So can you talk maybe about, you know, as Ava was doing, uh, maybe about some of the collaborations that you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we collaborated, we collaborate and have been collaborating with experimentalists a lot because it's uh, mutually beneficial, right? So a lot of times they will come to us and then uh, say, hey, you know, this, result is very unexpected. We don't know how to explain it. Can you, you know, give us some idea of what might be going on? And then uh, the other time, the other way would be we make predictions that, hey, this sequence will adopt this structure, it will be well structured. Can you please synthesize it and then do solution AMR, for example, and then, you know, 
let us know if our prediction is correct. So I think um, uh, both uh, aspects are uh, very important and then I think helpful to uh, both types of, uh, of scientists because the techniques are fundamentally very complementary to each other. What a chemist wants to know is what my molecules are doing. Like we imagine there are atoms and then this atom is interacting with this functional group, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, you don't see that in your mm -hmm. experiments, but you know that if I make this mutation, this is how the binding of thing will change. Then you try to rationalize why this will be the change. Then molecular dynamic simulation or computational tools are trying to visualize hey, I think this is how the molecules are, you know, moving around each other. This is what they do. There's only one thing. I don't know if it's right. <laughs> because it, after all, it's a, compu it's a computer model, right? So I don't know if it's right. Like the thing I see from my computer modeling. So I need some, somehow to make the connection to see if this makes sense, uh, you know, given that these are the experimental measurements. And then for the experiment, experiment measurements, then we are trying to say we can provide uh, molecular insights into it. And hopefully if we understand the system, we can guide, as Eva was saying, uh, next generation design. Yeah. yeah. What do you, oh, go ahead, yeah, Eva, please. So what was interesting is, so some of the, um, what you're just describing is some of the pushback that we originally got when we started talking to people about applying AI and machine learning is they're like, well, this is just a prediction, right? How do we know if it's right, right? So as a, as a data scientist, computer scientist, you actually um, have ways of estimating the performance of your computational systems, right? Where you can say, this is the accuracy that I expect, this is the sensitivity, yep. specificity. Right. But when you show it to um, other people, they're always skeptical. Right. And so that's why we actually ended up, um, you know, spending um, quite a bit of resources and actually validating what we're predicting mm -hmm. in the wet lab ourselves um, to convince people that these are very powerful um, technologies. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, there's always the skepticism yeah. or yes. is this correct? Right. Because it's been predicted by a computer. Um, uh -huh. Data yeah. doesn't exist yet. Right. Right. But then, you know, I think there are there are a lot of um, experimental uh, chemists or experimentalists. They, they are very open-minded and then they are willing to, you know, partner with you and then test your predictions. And then even, you know, your prediction might not be perfect. The first round, they are not mad at you. They, they know that, Hey, you know, this is needed, right? So you need to like work with your, work with your uh, model, like improve your, your platform. So uh, I am uh, very lucky to uh, have those collaborators who, you know, are uh, open-minded and then are very willing to have this two-way street and then improve uh, each other's science. Yeah. That's great. That's actually, Ava, that's kind of where I was headed with, I was going to ask, uh, you know, we talk about sort of like misconceptions, right? Like if something's magical or scary or, and so it, it, is that the biggest misconception that you find people have with AI and machine learning is the robustness of it or what in both your experience, what is the, the biggest misconception? That you I, I think I think a lot of it comes down to uh, people not understanding exactly what's happening under the hood. Um, and so when you show a result and you say, this is what I predict, um, it's still just a, a result in an Excel sheet, right? Um, but it hasn't actually come from their hands, from their data set. So, um, but I think as um, Yushan uh, mentioned, this is changing, right? So people are becoming more open-minded. People are hungry to apply these novel techniques to actually accelerate their projects um, and to gain an edge, right? Because we're living in a very competitive world. Um, and so I do think that this is changing. Um, but the other, the other thing that I think would help, um, and this is why I'm super excited about what you're doing, Yushan, and also other people, um, is um, people that visualize the results, right? Because when you visualize the results, um, it's a little bit easier to interact with it and becomes more believable, right? So machine learning can spit out a prediction for you saying this variant is, you know, has this probability and it's more likely to have, um, you know, better um, activity. But until you actually visualize it, um, it's still a little bit nebulous, I think, to people. So I think the visualization and the interpretation is what's going to take this to the next level. Yeah, I think... Uh, um just a word, I think machine learning can get people excited, but at the same time also scared, right? They were like, what is going on? Is, is it really mathy? Is it really computer science-y? It is like super beyond me, right? And uh, fundamentally, it's a uh, uh, parameter fitting. <laughs> With a very complicated relationship in principle can fit to any, you know, 
relations, right? And then, uh, but then the tricky thing is um, you want to have as small of a training data asset as possible, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't want to spend a lot of energy to collect the data, but then you want to have a good data set, right? So now you need to kind of have some way of cheating that is you are trying to guide your machine that okay maybe you don't need one trillion parameters okay i'm gonna tell you nearest neighbor interaction is probably the most important so you try to put in some human knowledge into it that try to reduce the complexity of the model and i think there is a lot um of expertise that you rely on right like how do you put this kind of, you know, human knowledge into developing what you think will be contributing importantly to the accuracy of the model. Then you try to reduce the number of parameters, but then at the same time, the data set you use to train is super important because if it's not diverse enough, you are actually just focusing on a very little corner, small corner of your, of your design space. Then now you ask this model to predict something that's completely different then it shouldn't be surprising that it will break down, <laughs> right? So you only, you're like, hey, you're going to take math, math, math class. And how about let's, you know, do some Chinese. I was like, oh, I've never seen Chinese before. Right? So, so uh, you, you will need to uh, kind of make sure that your training data set is kind of representative. And uh, as Eva said, there are a lot of checks that you can do to make sure that, hey, this can indeed be a, applied more universally or, hey, I'm not overfitting. And so um, we will just need to approach it uh, carefully. And another question that I commonly get asked is, so how many sequences do you need? (laughs) (laughs) I I, I wish I could tell you how many sequences I need. I wish I can tell you how many sequences I need, right? Because I, I, if I know how complicated the problem is, I already solve it. So I do not know how complicated the relationship between the sequence and the structure to your property is. Mm -hmm. And then I also don't know how many amino acids you want to include in this library, right? And then it all depends. So I only know that once I build a model, I can tell you if it's good or not, if it's valid or not. Mm -hmm. But until I do so, unfortunately, I don't have any, you know, magic formula. It's like, did you say membrane permeability? Hmm, 2100. No, that never happened. So I don't know if Eva has any trick, you know, like you can actually just like a priori say, give me 10,000, promise you that it will be a good model. Yeah. So unfortunately, we do have to give some estimates to people about right. how much data uh-huh. to generate, right? Yes. So I completely, first of all, I completely support what you said about the um, design space and like making sure that you create diverse data sets, right? Um, but like in terms of the size of the data sets, this is a question we get on every single phone call. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. So, Tell me, what's the secret? But, you know, so what I've seen before, um, and we were surprised by this because people say, well, you need a lot of data to train machine learning. And that's, yes, if you need cross-validation, if you need to uh, say, this is the AUC of my model, but we've actually been able to train a machine learning model with just six positive data points and 94 mm-hmm. negative data points and we're able to prioritize additional compounds that should be tested actually really well uh, with a much better enrichment that you would ever get you know fourfold enrichment compared to random right so that's like the extreme six positive data points but on the Mm -hmm. other hand i've also worked on immunology data sets if you've ever touched immunology you know that Mm -hmm. as soon as you change pipette tips the assay changes right because they're so sensitive and the immunology data sets we had 10,000 or 20,000 data points, right? And still the models didn't have good performance. And a lot of it had to do with the quality of the data, right? The fact that it wasn't quite reproducible, that it came from different labs, um, that it, you know, it came from different patient samples. So um, this this is really a question of like, it could be anywhere from literally a few Mm -hmm, data, mm -hmm. like thousands of data points. Um, But the quality of the data, honestly, um, it can also shape that equation quite a bit. Right. Yep. So like one project we had where we just did MIC values for anti-microbial um, peptides, super easy. Everything worked perfectly. But then you go back to like um, activating T cells with peptide mm-hmm. antigens, mm-hmm. you know, week to week, you know, completely different story. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. the system. Yeah. 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 
So can you take like all your projects and like machine learn the right information? <laughs> so you can be like all of the AI you know, projects that I've done for antimicrobial peptides. <laughs> this is what you need. Like, I'm just being silly. No, but in fact, so the funny thing is that I, um, you know, at some point I was so, I still, you know, use machine learning whenever I can, right? There are situations where you can make models on top of models, right? Where you can understand what were kind of the key driving factors. Um, and so what you're proposing is not outside of the realm of possibilities. <laughs> nice. Um, I, I'm kind of curious to know, you know, AI and machine learning really is everywhere, right? It's not just in chemistry and biology. I mean, the, it seems like every time I scroll on LinkedIn, I see AI for something. This could be clinical <laughs> trials or whatever. What what areas are you seeing to be most sort of promising and maybe most accepted outside of just the, the chemistry and biology space? Or are, are your heads even outside of that space? <laughs> I'm just wondering where it's not being utilized. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think our um, our area is probably like the most, um, I guess, surprisingly, it's related to drug development, but there are a lot of, um, I guess, AI applications that are really, really uh, related to our everyday life. And um, it has a lot of, I guess, social uh, impact in it as well. So, for example, if you now want to watch TV, you have this button to press and then you recognize your voice and Netflix, play something, something, right? It has AI in it because they train the voice recognition system. And then the funny thing is, uh, I think it has been improved a lot. But I think it used to be trained with very standard English. So then if you have an accent, then it throws the, it throws the, the, the machine off, right? Because I don't know what you just said, right? And then similar things can happen with facial recognition, right? So uh, the training data set, once again, is uh, very important uh, there. And so um, I think as, um, as we might think, I think it likely is everywhere and, um, People are using it to do good things and bad things as well, right? So you can have deep fake now, right? You've seen on Facebook that they can actually make pictures. They look like movie stars, right? So they're like, oh, these are movie stars look like. And now they can generate pictures they look like movie star, movie star looking, right? So then um, people can now make all sorts of interesting things uh, that look real, yeah. Uh, and then you are almost unable to tell right. because the machine has made sure of that. Yeah, absolutely. And even, yeah, yeah voice. Yeah, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. incredibly um, amazing and scary Yeah, at the same time. But I, I think in general, all of these, um, what I've seen before, all the innovations happen first in tech, right? In mm -hmm. industries where there's enormous data sets available. So social yeah. media, sorry mm -hmm. about that. Somebody's at the door. Uh, social media, um, uh, you know, uh, Im images, right? So a lot of images, yeah. but all those innovations initially happen on those data sets, speech recognition, right? right? And then all those innovations, even deep fakes, they were slowly carried over to other um, domains. Yeah. Right mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. do deep fakes of, of small molecules. So you can create completely novel molecules now that haven't existed before. Um, so... Yeah. What I've seen is basically a transition of all these exciting tools mm -hmm. being developed for other purposes, and then we right. repurpose them. We just kind of adjust yes. them. Right. Yeah. There. You can. You can like do hallucination. You know, to design proteins. Yes. And uh, our lab is also very interested in uh, this technique called change point detection, which people use a lot, like to predict. For example, like is there an onset of stock market? Right. Can I? Can you? Can you predict, right? And then, uh, but then I think our, our systems might be easier to handle because uh, typically for a well-equilibrated system, you see things being visited back and forth. And so what we are trying to do is to uh, use change point detection to actually uh, monitor if anything interesting happens in your MD simulation without a human needing to watch the movie and say, hey, I think this beta helping just formed or something, right? So we want to uh, have an objective algorithm that tells us, oh, this change has happened at where of your protein. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. All right, I, um, do you guys have any questions for each other? I mean, you're here. 
I'm very interested in how to uh, start a company, especially when you, when Eva said that hey, it's very similar to uh, you know running an academic lab. I'm like, yes, really. <laughs> the, the, it's just the funding sources are different, right? Uh-huh. And 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 the stuff that you work on essentially has to have a business um, kind of outcome, right? Um, mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, there has to be a way to make money from it eventually, right? At least that that's what the way you have to kind of think about it, right? So whether it's um, you develop a technology and somebody acquires it, or whether it's you develop technology becomes a piece of software that then you sell. Um, so if that piece um, comes together, you know, it is possible to actually raise money. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, one of the best ways to raise money is to actually go for SBAR funding. Um, mm-hmm. So, but you know, the biggest advice I give to people when they ask me about starting companies is try to figure out where the money. Um, basically, try to engage with customers as early on as possible, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, some technologies take a long time to develop, but mm-hmm. you can start essentially providing uh, what you have, um, the pieces that you develop over time, to start generating revenue, right, and growing the company using revenue. Not everything requires a ten million or twenty million dollar investment right off the bat using VC funding. So. I'm a big proponent in slowly building out technology using revenue and grant funding, but that's just my personal opinion. Right. But um, yeah. I just want to put a plug for uh, for one thing. So yes. at the uh, Boulder Peptide Symposium in November in 22, we are actually hosting a workshop on how to start a company. Oh. So I invite everybody to join. So, uh, <laughs> I'm one of the organizers of that workshop, and we are really looking forward into, again, demystifying the process of starting companies for people. Um, And so hopefully um, it will be an exciting workshop. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Exploration Science. As always, we welcome your feedback and also your suggestion for topics that you'd like to see covered. If you enjoy this episode, please like and share with your community. Thanks again for tuning in.